Can just all of us clap at the same time? Yeah. So, one, two, three. <laughs> I wasn't ready. <laughs> Let's try that again. One, two, three. Okay. All right. <laughs> We're off to a great start. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go to podcast. Now, your hosts. Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not too bad yourself. Doing great. All right. I've got a list of things that I want to talk about. Is this so, like a thing? No, it's yeah. been, it's been great, great. Great being at Identiverse, seeing so many old friends, but meeting new friends. Here's things that people have come up and talked to me about. Number one, so many people who are listening to the podcast are here. People I haven't met and listen all the time, so, you know, just coming up and introducing themselves. Number two was my jacket that I was wearing yeah, yesterday. You had, you had a jacket, yes. <laughs> I'd like to put a link to the jacket in the show notes. Is that possible? I mean, like, what do you mean? Like, like, so if somebody else wants to buy it, they can. Like that jacket or, I mean, like... No, no, I'm not reselling it. Okay. If somebody wants to buy it, the same jacket. I, I was concerned you might start selling your path water or something. No. <laughs> but in the same vein, I guess. <laughs> uh, no, like one of the main things people remember about the podcast is what I said about the Atlanta airport. Yeah. Yeah. Smelling like an open bathroom. It did not smell like that when I traveled through that. You probably weren't in the part that I was in. Maybe it was you. People really liked that. They thought it was hilarious. <laughs> okay. Okay. We were able to solve that dilemma. Atlanta, you smell great. <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> uh, why don't we get to it? Before we do that, I want to shout out to RSM, Cyberist Alliance, the ones that are making all this possible. They've got this extravagant room for us to be able to record in, and RSM for Bringing us out here. I have found a lot of people don't really know that we work for RSM. Yeah. So like, a lot of people are like, oh, I thought you just did the podcast. Like, I wish, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we work for RSM. So uh, but we do a good job of trying to keep it separate. This is vendor neutral. We don't do commercials, that kind of thing. So why don't we get right to it? We've got a very big panel here, probably think, the largest show we've ever done, I believe. We've got uh, directors for the Digital Identity Advancement Foundation, DIAF.link. We've got Ian Blazer, Aaron Crow, and Alan Foster. Welcome, guys. And then we've got the Kim Cameron Award winners. We've got Sophie Badani Taylor and Matthew Spence. Welcome, everybody, to the show. Thanks for having Thank us. Great to be here. Thanks for taking the time. Um, we're going to get to you guys in a second. And really, the focus of the show is we're going to be kind of on your guys' journey to get here. But to set the stage, let's talk about the Digital Identity Advancement Foundation. Why don't we just start with what is the Digital Identity Foundation? Ian, you want to take a crack? Sure. So thanks for having us. Uh, it means a lot, the support. Is really great. Um, so DIAF is a Digital Identity Advancement Foundation. It's a 501c3 nonprofit uh, focused on creating more opportunities for people globally to study and learn and explore digital identity. Primarily, at least to start, the way we're doing that is through the removal of financial barriers. So being able to bring people to industry events that they normally wouldn't be able to otherwise. That's a great mission. I love it. I want to find out more about how we can contribute now. I'm going to go to you next. We'll talk about that. Okay. And we are recording live, so we're going to come in. There's our friend Dave. Hey, Dave. <laughs> so, Alan, how do people contribute to Diet? Well, basically, get hold of us and give us money. And there's ways to do that. So, we've got a link. If you go to diaf.link slash donate, it brings up a web page, and we can get some money in that way. Also, if you have other ideas or other ways you want to be able to do it, you can always send us an email, and then... We probably put the email address into the, the notes underneath mm -hmm. because it's a nice long one. It turns out all of the identity domain names were sort of gone. Yeah, you're trying to buy anything. <laughs> Did you want any blah? No. Like, work over all your money. But we do have an, an email address that folks can send in questions or comments or ideas mm -hmm. for other awards and things like that. And um, obviously the donate link up on the website is probably the easiest way to get into that. Mm -hmm. Alan, is there a minimum donation? Oh, great question. We haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, everything works, right? And everything helps. Obviously, 
truth's more of a donation becomes. Well, if someone would do ten dollars or something, they could do that. That's great. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Aaron, what's the Kim Cameron Award? What does this say? So the Kim Cameron Award is one of our two awards um, and specifically designed to help people that are newer in their careers uh, or maybe discovering identity at a later stage in their careers have access to great events like these, Identiverse, which are foundational for so many people's uh, professional networks that they build, as well as skill building, um, access to a lot of other great resources here. But as Ian mentioned, um, these expenses can be quite costly, especially for folks that maybe they haven't landed their first job yet or they're in their first year. Maybe they're at a company that isn't sponsoring them to go. So the Kim Cameron Award is designed to remove the barriers so that more people can come and access these great resources. And this is the first of these awards, or has there been one? Was there one? Well, year? so Open ID Foundation about three years ago created the award. Uh, yeah, it would have been about three years ago, and so they originally incubated this award um, in, in Kim's memory because he was such a big part of Open ID Foundation and his work. Last summer, uh, the then executive director Don Tebow uh, approached Alan and I and said, "Hey." Like, we want a proper home for this thing, right? Like Open ID Foundation's got a whole different mission. We love doing this, but it's not a focus. And so Alan and I started talking to a bunch of other organizations like ID Pro and WID and Kantara, trying to figure out like what was the best way to structure this. And out of that, we've decided to create a new nonprofit charity, which is what we did. And so this is the first year that DIAF has been operating the award uh, and looking forward to many years to come. <laughs> That's excellent. I think that, um... You know, Kim Cameron was just such a, a legend within the space. I know that term gets overused sometimes, but I remember my first identity conference was uh, the Digital ID World Conference, and that was like 05 when he came. He just moved to Microsoft and just published the Laws of Identity, and it was like, I mean, I, I look at the Laws of Identity every couple of years just to, you know, get blown away by how relevant they still are. I mean, the guy was way ahead of the rest of us. Yep. <laughs> I, I look at those slots every couple of years too, just in case there's a quiz, right? I just want to make sure. No, 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 it's cool, don't rub up my card. Do we need to update those laws with AI now? Not with AI, no. <laughs> <laughs> Although it is, as you say, we're looking at it 15 years later, and it's still very relevant for each and every one of the laws. It's still what we need to be able to look at. And so it is amazing how relevant they have stayed all throughout the, the 15, 20 years we've been working within the space. Yeah, absolutely. So the focus of the episode is to talk to Matt and Sophie. And I'd like to kind of start with, how did you, what's your origin story? How did you find yourself pursuing a career, a degree in cybersecurity, and hopefully a career in digital identity. Uh, so I started out studying cybersecurity in university. Um, I went to Texas A&M and was heavily involved in the burgeoning at the time cybersecurity program there. And um, one summer I was an intern working in a security operations center and got really bored because I was waiting on the engineering team to get me like an API for an internal tool for like a month. Um, and so I just started like researching things, cool things about security and the one that stuck with me immediately was identity. Um, so I kind of just was fascinated from there and ended up working at a digital identity startup called Everton. Um, and eventually um, found my way into the United States Senate as a, a technology policy advisor, uh, which was quite a journey. Yeah, I definitely want to hear more about that. So, how about you? Yeah, so I fell into digital identity kind of by accident, which since being here I found out is a very common journey. Um, so I was working at a tech consultancy um, doing digital ethics consulting um, in a practice that I helped co-found. And the company mentioned that they were kind of interested in this thing called digital identity. And I had the complete luxury of just having like several weeks for over a month just to kind of spend all my time figuring out like what it was, what standards were happening, um, what the regulation was, what kind of national case studies were looking like. And yeah, I was just completely hooked. I, I couldn't believe that was something I didn't know about before. Um, so since then, I've spent pretty much all my time kind of researching around this area of digital ID. That's awesome. And so now you're here at Identiverse, one of the biggest conferences within the industry. 
wondering what kind of experience have you had so far on serving that? Um, surprising, uh, welcoming. Um, it's a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be, uh, which has been awesome to see. Uh, and just the, the, the amazing degree to which this is such a welcoming community. Everybody's super nice. We, we're getting invited to things. People that we've never met before um, are just coming up and talking to us, and they're they're you know telling us all these things and giving us so much awesome information. Um, it's been it's been really great. Have you picked up any of the swag? Have you gotten any of the giveaways at the booths? Um, so I actually won. There's the scratch off card. Um, um, what? So I yeah. thought they were all losers. No, I actually won <laughs> hats. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I still need to pick that up, but my scratch off card was a winner. And then I did, I, I will admit to going a little bit of, doing a little bit of swag hunting on the expo floor. Okay, did you get anything really memorable? Um, some, some good t-shirts, uh, and, and a, I think a pair of socks. Yeah, from what I hear, there's there's some uh, fans, sneakers floating out there, so. I might have the best swag that I think that I couldn't resist. You can't resist. Enrique can't talk to me into that one, for sure. I have a collection of, of conference swag, so. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a life's journey. And eventually you get to the point where you go to conferences and you don't want any of it. But, Sophie, how have you enjoyed the conference so far? Yeah, I have to echo Matt. It's been so welcoming and from the start, like it's, it's a bit intimidating coming into such a big space, not really knowing many people at all, but it's just been such a friendly community. And I've, I've really enjoyed the mix of having the kind of big stage keynotes, which are really exciting and kind of think a lot about the future and the big picture. And then these more intimate conversations about the kind of day to day and yeah, what people are doing on the ground. It's amazing how deep they get sometimes. Mm -hmm. Are you swag hunting as well? I am swag hunting, but now I'm finding out I'm not being that successful. So, <laughs> yesterday. Um, after this, we're gonna go swag hunting. Yeah. Well, yesterday I picked up a bag of coffee, which I thought was like the best swag, and I smelled like coffee all day, but now, now I know there's vans. Yeah, vans. <laughs> yeah. Let's go yeah. look for those. So, the important thing is, did you leave space to bring this stuff home? A that's, little, a little. That's the rookie mistake, right? Did you collect all the swag, and then all of a sudden you're that person in the airport that has like the duct tape around their suitcase trying to like get it all into the overhead that clearly is not going to fit. So. That might end up being me. <laughs> What's been the most impactful or I guess important thing, thing you want to take away that you've heard throughout this entire conference so far? So let's stick with you. Yeah, I found, for me, I don't come from a kind of cybersecurity background at all. I've thought a lot more about um, digital identity as a form of enablement, um, particularly in the kind of international development sector. So it's been really interesting to learn more about the relationship between enablement and security and how you can make sure that people can access what they need to access, perhaps things they've never accessed before, but in a way that really protects them and protects the organization that's doing that so that it can be more sustainable. Um, so yeah, that's been a really useful entry point for me. So someone who wasn't in digital identity and now you are, mm -hmm. what did you think digital identity was before you attended this or got more involved with, with digital identity? I mean, before I knew about what it was, I think I really had no idea. And, and it's been interesting. I did a, a research sprint two years ago now, I think, with the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard. Um, and there, there were conversations around you know, how you present yourself online, what information you share, what photos you have, and there can be this really philosophical view of what digital identity is. Um, and I think that's still true, um, but there are also kind of much more grounded ways of thinking about it and what kind of innovations can come about to make sure that kind of verified, trusted information can be shared in a really secure way. So I think relating those different levels is, is kind of a useful thing to get from this. Matt, what's something that's really impacted you this week? I think uh, listening to some of the talks, especially those that are about the direct impact and kind of the customer journeys that people go through with um, deploying some digital identity technology has been really impactful. I'm a technical guy, software engineer, cybersecurity analyst. Like, it's really easy for me to get bogged down in the details of the implementation without and lose focus on the, the, and the people that are at the end of the products and you know, the services. Um, so I think that's helped to really ground my understanding of why we do all of this, uh, which is something that, you know, it, in the back of my mind is always there. It's kind of why I'm interested in this. But again, it's so easy to get, I mean, I'm a nerd, right? I, I really like the technical stuff. It's just so easy to lose sight of, of what this is all for. Um, and so some of that has been, has been I think, very impactful. 
because um, we're the award recipients for the Kim Cameron Award. And I'm wondering, and that will start with you, how did you hear about the award and what was the submission process? And I'm hoping you can kind of get detailed enough so that other folks figure out, okay, here's how I go about something like this. So in my case, um, like any good former congressional staffer, I have a crippling Twitter addiction. Um, and so I heard about it because from some of my previous work in digital identity, I was just kind of, I was up at the edge of a lot of those circles. Um, and so it, it popped across my Twitter feed one day and I, uh, I just clicked the link and I was What's Twitter right now? <laughs> I switched to X now, yeah. So, um, I, I will always be following Twitter though. Um, and I would just say that the application process was 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 very, I think, straightforward. Um, you know, if you can find the link, you, you have all the resources that you really need. It's um, it's more about understanding what to put into the submission, talking about your journey, and really what you'll get out of the uh, out of the award. Great. Um, same question for you, Sophie. Yeah, so most of the time I'm a PhD student focusing on digital ID, but part time I also work with OIX, Open Identity Exchange. And part of that job is kind of scouring the news for what's happening in digital ID every day. So really luckily doing that meant that I also found out about this award. Um, so similarly, I think I'd recommend just like having a list of accounts or um, people whose work you were inspired by to follow and look at on, the, on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, kind of stumbled across it, but kind of by immersing myself in that space. Um, and similarly, yeah, I think it was quite an, an easy process. Um, like Matt, I also thought a lot about not only why I want to go, but what I can do with this. I mean, it's a huge privilege to get to come here. So thinking about what we can do with this and get more people excited. Great. Absolutely. So, so Matt, you had mentioned about this Senate Fellowship. I'd like to dig into that a little bit more, maybe get more of an explanation. What was that all about? That sounds pretty unique. Yeah, so going from a software engineer straight into being a uh, policy advisor in the Senate is not a very typical journey. Um, and I came into that through uh, a nonprofit uh, program called Tech Congress that places early and mid career technologists in uh, the United States Congress uh, on, for anywhere from about eight months to a, a year to help fill the knowledge gap that exists because you know a lot of the Congress is very old, not all, a lot of them have technology backgrounds and not a lot of their staffers have technology backgrounds either. A lot of the staff tends to be people who are, are, are or have studied law and things like that, which is very useful, but when you're dealing with technology, there's no substitute for that real world expertise. Sure. Um, and I wanted to try to address some of the barriers uh, to digital identity adoption that come through the policy side. So that was kind of why I took that, uh, that journey. It's very cool, very unique. And also I should say, um, uh, Tech Congress hope opens up for applications um, at techcongress.io on a regular basis, I think twice a year. Uh, not as much this year because it's an election year and that ends up being really weird if they put a fellowship. If your fellowship extends to the middle of an election, you could lose your job halfway through, which is not ideal, but starting next year, they'll be they'll be doing those uh, applications again regularly, and anybody from with any kind of a technology background can be there. It's a direct path to have a really big impact. Yeah, what I think is really cool about the whole thing is, uh, so my son is a cyber major, freshman, just finished his freshman year, and it feels like you know going from an engineering background, you kind of feel like just like a regular person. Now all of a sudden, you're in the Senate fellowship. That's a pretty Cool experience, right? It is, and it's what's cool about it is that is that it's like it's crazy and it's wild, and that you learn so much. But it's also a Tech Congress. There are lots of fellowship programs actually for uh, people of different backgrounds to get involved in policy. But Tech Congress, I think, is a great one because they prepare you so well. You don't have to have any policy knowledge, any knowledge of how the U.S. government works. They'll teach you all of it for a month or two you know, like a boot camp style. And then you'll go in and you'll actually be more prepared than just about any staffer. Because one of the other things is that most congressional staffers get zero training going in. You actually do get two months. So you actually come in as one of the best prepared people, even if you have zero policy background at first. That's cool. Now, now Sophie, for somebody like my son, freshman, you know, has 
this much cybersecurity knowledge now because it's like you're still getting your ABCs in place, you know, your intro to writing, your algebra course, and then you have one cyber class. What kind of recommendations would you have for somebody in that point in the journey? Because it seems to me like you kind of become like the superstar uh, student, if you will. Thank you, that's really kind. Um, I think just kind of making the most of the resources, loads of people in the identity space have really great blogs that you can read on a regular basis. Yeah, podcasts. Listening to the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that, I'm wrong, but um, YouTube videos can be great. I mean, really just immersing yourself and perhaps also being, kind of getting a sense of which part of the space really interests you. I think it's useful to, to kind of become an expert in a particular area, and, and I think that's the case for any domain, um, but it's really easy to do that. And, and the more you learn about the sector, the more you'll realize kind of what really suits your skill set and your interests and things like that. Awesome. I was reading through your bio and it mentioned that you pursued a master's in digital sociology. I did, yes. What the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> I think I know less what that is now than I did before I did. Um, so it's kind of a new um, discipline. The, the masters I did has only existed for about five years. Um, and it's really kind of trying to get a sense of what's happening in the digital world through a sociological perspective and how it's reshaping relationships between different people, communities, people and their governments. And so actually for someone interested in digital ID, it's quite an, an obvious space to go into. Um, yeah, because digital ID I think is really all about relations and trust. Um, and so the sociological perspective is really helpful for that. Very interesting. Um, Aaron, I want to come back to you for a second because we've got two award winners here and they talk about their submission process. And I guess maybe open question, we'll start with Aaron. What are, what is the, the DIF looking for, DIF, looking for in submissions? How do we help people fulfill their dreams of being not only at Identiverse and other conferences, but maybe even someday on the Identity Center podcast? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think I was really happy to hear, um, you know, reflecting on like, what is it that you want to get out of the conference? Because that was specifically one of the things that we wanted to assess is, does somebody have a really specific goal where they want to attend that we can help them achieve um, through sponsoring and supporting um, their access to these events? Some of the other things that we look at just on a, a more like tactical basis is like, what is the time of experience that they've had with identity? Are they totally new to the topic? Are they uh, students? Are they advanced grads? Are they people that have been in the profession for a couple of different years? So we can kind of assess, you know, where they are and relatively speaking, like what is the benefit both that they can bring into the award through their determination and their skills that they want to build on and what we can return to them by offering them the resources to go. Do you have anything to add to that now, Andrew, Ian? No, I mean, we we were looking at what could they bring, you know, and, and do they have a, a sort of an opinion about what they wanted to learn? And so we thought about impact and we thought about the problems that they were interested in. And we had dozens and dozens of applicants and it was fascinating just to see how mature a lot of this was right and i was thinking about myself at, at a similar age i was like you know i like macaroni it was probably the best thing i could write in a <laughs> response like macaroni. i do yeah, actually yeah it came up last time uh but to see like really very specific sort of like i am interested in these real specific topics and this is what i want to do with it like that blew me away because i, I I was just getting into identity at that point and it was doing it through a product, right? So to see someone already having a, like well thought out opinions about it was, was really encouraging for all of us, right? Because we need more global talent in this space. Can I add one other thing to that? I, I knew that it was going to be difficult to pick um, uh, just as few winners as we could. I mean, this first year that we were doing this, uh, when I saw how many applications we got, but I didn't appreciate how difficult it was going to be until I started reading the applications because we had so many high quality um, applications, there were so many that I was like, I, I wish that we could send more folks this year. Which is why, if you're listening, you should contribute because we can. Like, really, this is about outcomes. When we talk about organizations who are thinking about sponsoring, it's what this means. Every dollar means we are closer to bringing one more person to an event. Or as we start to get into other programs, you know, being able to bring one more participant into that. And and that's really, that's really gratifying to be able to say like, oh, wow. This year, we are bringing someone, not only two people to Identiverse, two to EIC next week, uh, and then one to Authenticate. So we've actually started to grow the applicant pool, or sorry, grow the widow pool. We only want that to continue. Well, yeah. thank you to you guys for starting this and 
donate. I'm sure there's so many hours that go into it. So I know doing a one hour podcast is like 10 hours of work on the back end. So I can appreciate. So and, and, and it's fun, right? When else can you get up at seven o'clock in the morning every week for Zoom calls? <laughs> Well, I think it's just part of the culture right now. Yeah. We're a global economy, we're global organizations. Identity doesn't stop at nine o'clock and nine to five. We work nine to five hours, right? So we Wait, you don't log in? I, 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 I'm not saying me personally. Oh, okay. right? yeah. <laughs> I, I think I'm just adding a little bit more about in the selection process that one of the things that I was looking for was the this is a community to get involved in. And so the responses that come back it's not so much attending, it's is this person coming in to get involved? Because if they're involved, then they're going to be part of the engine to move forward into the next one. So that involvement, I think, is an important piece. I'm pretty sure all of you have been to Vegas, because I think I've seen you here. Have you guys been to Vegas before? Not since I was like a small child. OK, so let's get into this. <laughs> <laughs> what do we think of Vegas? I was talking about this yesterday and realized Vegas, so I live in Oxford, um, Vegas is like the exact opposite of Oxford, <laughs> so it's a very crazy place. It's quite fascinating, thing. like obviously it's, it's kind of, I'm spending most of my time at the conference, but like I feel so lucky to also be able to see this like completely different environment to what I know. Um, yeah, just like lots of showbiz and It's as if like things. a theme park became a city. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is there a favorite thing that you've seen that's not Identiverse related mm. or experienced? <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday I, got, I went to the Bellagio um, and saw the fountain show, which was really cool, and the botanical gardens. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's spectacular. It's, it's, yeah, it's really cool to see. Matthew, what do you think? Um, yeah, uh, Vegas is wild. Um, it's just it's a city of so much contrast, where you're you've got this all these fountains and these fancy hotels and everything, and, and on the strip right there, and then you know you go a little far, a little outside, and you're in the desert. Um, I, I think there's there's a lot that I want to see here. Um, there's I I went on a run down the strip, and it's like there's just too much to you know, kind of take in the short amount of time that we have. Would you come back? I think I would come back. I want to bring my wife at some point. I don't think she's ever been to Vegas. Uh, I think it's the kind of thing you need to at least once. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I, I think it would be fun to go a trip with friends when I can, you know, I don't have to be quite as so professional. <laughs> Sophie, you I think me too, yeah. I mean, the weather here is amazing. Um, I know a lot of people complain about the heat, but <laughs> I'm a bit jealous because it rains a lot where I'm from. So, yeah, getting to kind of see more of that and more of, I mean, I think you could just sit and people watch for like a week and it would be fascinating. <laughs> it's a world class here. One of my favorite things to do. The weather, not so much. I like to sit inside a more of an indoor pant. I like okay. to <laughs> But if there's a window that I can watch the strip and different things happening, yeah, for sure. Um, you guys were talking about an escape room, and I'm fascinated by escape. I've never actually done one, but I think there was one that took place last night. Was this, I guess, was it an idea for, I know, I, I, I'm an indoor cat. Yeah, but the escape, escape room is literally right now, like you're in one first. Oh, but you never want to escape out. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. I guess, tell us about the escape room. Like, what was this about? Why should I, who's never done one, would you recommend it? Give me some insight. Yeah, so we got invited um, by uh, Sarah Cicchetti, um to go do an escape room with uh, a bunch of other people, attendees here at Identiverse. Um, we, we loaded into a party bus, uh, which I've also never gone on a party bus before, <laughs> um, which was fun. And we, we piled into this escape room, and it was competitive. Um, so it was two teams. And uh, we were all very sure that Sarah's team was going to win because she like, does a lot of escape rooms. Um, but actually, uh, her team lost by uh, the innocent margins because the, the team I was on, which was the other one, at the end just started brute forcing all of the, <laughs> all of the clues. And so like the last two or three in a row, we just, we got like halfway in and we're like, okay, there's only like 32 possible combinations left. Let's just try them all. <laughs> so then we got it with like, it was an hour long. Uh, we, we got it, we, we had 57 minutes that it took. So we only just barely finished. But you finished and you we applied did. real world attack I was going to say, it's credential <laughs> stuff. Right? You know, yeah, like, this is what I learned. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. And yeah. So there was actually a lot of math involved, too. At one point, I was literally on a lock counting in binary. 
um, because it's like we knew that the combination was one of two things, and so I was just go ones and ones and zeros, you know, just up until and I got so close to getting that one right, I gave up literally three uh, before I would. Uh, kind of Tell me that you're perfect for identity without telling me you're perfect. For identity. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be probably our promo for this. <laughs> Sophie, what was your experience like? Yeah, it was super fun. Like the theme was up 1940s casino, which was very apt for Vegas. Um, so smoke films and all <laughs> in the desert. Yeah, escaped convicts and all this kind of wanted science. It was fun. Um, but yeah, it was just cool to be able to hang out. Like we were saying, the, the community's been really friendly, but to be able to hang out on a more personal level and get to know people um, and do some problem solving, which is, yeah, it was really nice. Excellent. Did you guys take part in this at all? Do your own thing? No, I, so I mean, Sarah, for those of you who know her, AWS, co-founder Abby Pro, um, it, Matthew undersells like she is like everywhere she goes like <laughs> any country any city like and so the fact that you you actually beat her team is remarkable no so Sarah had her her enclave go off and and I was I was with other identity people there was a fun identity pro thing going on and she was like you know going around and seeing everybody so it was a good time what's the best thing you guys have eaten while you've been here because I think Las Vegas is world class for food <laughs> I had a pork roll at Momofuku last night, mm -hmm. which I read about online and it lived up to the hype. Yeah, <laughs> it was really, really nice. That's good. I got takeout from Din Tai Fung and I got some um, uh, uh, the pork buns uh, that were pretty amazing. Jim Lowe. It was the wind buffet, so there were a lot of things that were on that buffet that were excellent. And you are a buffet guy. I'm a buffet guy. Is it still Caesars? Is the Reigning champion? Because you were talking about it's, it's the reigning champion for seafood. But I think when, and actually the Wicked Spoon over at the Cosmo, they've got yes. some really good dishes that, so that's my thing actually, buffets. Like, I think some people go in and it's like competitive eating. I paid $90, I need to eat $90 in crowd legs. That's not my approach. My approach is I want to have $90 worth of enjoyment. So I might have a piece of pizza. I'm gonna eat a lot of desserts. Wait, Jim, can I just seafood buffet and landlocked state? I just I'm I'm struggling <laughs> a little with that. Like they they airdrop that. it in. I get that. I know that. I know it's true. I know there are airports. Yeah, yeah, I don't in for some other. Oh, country. for sure. But just I have a hard time with seafood and landlocked states. Add buffet to it. I don't know. I did for a while. I used to think sushi in St. Louis. But yeah, are you immortal? Like, any, <laughs> anywhere you go in the United States or Canada, I mean, there's many sushi restaurants and they're world class, and there's like there's no fish living anywhere close by. But there is FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> and and the the thinking about it, there's probably the freshest seafood in Vegas than almost anywhere else in the country. And it, it's entirely true. <laughs> And they have ice that they put it on, so that keeps it totally. What is this with yeah, right. <laughs> What about you guys? What's uh, what's the best thing you guys eat in here? Well, now I know we made the right awardee choice because my favorite restaurants in Vegas are Momofuku and Din Tai Fung. I went to Din Tai Fung <laughs> last night and Momofuku tonight, so those are my picks. Right. Um, maybe it's been the people rather than. But you ate people. What I, no, I did not eat people. It was it's the people yeah, exactly. I was at dinner like that. with. Yeah. Um, but we did, uh, there's one here in, in the hotel, I think it's Cathedral or Cathedral or something like that. And they had, uh, there was um, fish, the fish dish that was actually quite spectacular. So that was my enjoyment out of that one. So. Did you get the dessert where it's like a little Klondike bar on top and you break it? And now I need to go back. <laughs> they got a commercial that they run over and over again for the restaurants. And the head chef eats that during the during the commercial. Now I have to go back. Yeah, you have to go back now just for that. Do you guys all have, like fancy stuff? I had the best curly fries. The proper eats food hall. It was so simple, but they were fresh. Like right over here. I know the proper eats I'm saying. I'm gonna oh, it was yeah, the, the chicken, the soul soul chicken. Oh, the chicken. Korean one. Yes. yes. And it was. Really I think we can all agree that curly fries taste better than regular fries, but no one can explain why. It's the curl. 
<laughs> yeah, but say more. Yeah, it adds a flavor profile. I see. Yeah, yeah, to a straight food. <laughs> All right, we got silly, but this is why we have fun at the end of the show. Um, anything else you want to bring up, or should we really? Ian, did you say what you're? Oh yeah, Ian. Did you look like this? I best bite. I'm gonna change it up. I had a we had a wonderful bottle of vintage champagne last night Ooh. at dinner, and it was absolutely right, lovely. Share what you have. Uh, a Marc Hebrer 2018, uh, and I'm probably mispronouncing his last name, uh, and it was lovely. Uh, and I was with good friends, um, which was nice in an incredibly loud place. That is the one thing, and I will admit, maybe I need to, you know, get off the lawn here a little bit, that I'm, it's a little bit harder now when it's like yeah. really loud Vegas restaurant with weird acoustics. Have you noticed that they all have weird acoustics? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I could at least focus on my champagne, and that was great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it is sometimes hard to hold a conversation with that stuff. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you so much for being on the show. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And being here and the pinnacle of your career has been on this podcast. So you'll come back. It's all so, so far. far. So, yeah, come on. Bigger things coming. We hope so, for sure. Um, Impossible. Come back. Maybe next time we were at a conference together, we can do like a, hey, what, you know, what's changed, you know, since then? Uh, Digital Identity Advancement Foundation, DIF. Dot link. We'll have links in our show notes so people can find out more information, contribute. This is the result of people contributing to foundations and nonprofits and things like that to get people out to have these conversations. And hopefully people enjoy that out there who are watching and are listening. So you can visit us on the web, idacpodcast.com. Jim will slap me in the back of the head if I don't mention YouTube. YouTube.com slash at idacpodcast. If you go to our website, everything's like there too. Mastodon at IDAC podcast at infosec.exchange, Twitter, X, whatever it's called by the time you see or hear this at IDAC podcast. Connect with us on LinkedIn. We'll have links in our show notes for everything we talked about today, including LinkedIn profiles. So people reach out and connect and uh, keep growing this community. So with that, we'll kind of leave it for this one. Thanks everybody for watching and or listening. And we'll talk with you all in the next one. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> you've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center. <laughs>